behind this grim, unwelcoming coastline, the calm waters of the Helford River are like an interlude of sudden sunshine in storm. Here, the notorious Frenchman's Creek was once the hideout of pirates and smugglers. But the days of brandy running and wrecking passed. Today, the river is a haven for the somewhat less active form of life, the oyster. And Helford is the home of MacFisheries Oyster Farm. Oyster cultivation in Britain is at least as old as the Roman occupation. And today, 2,000 years after that great oyster fancier Julius Caesar, it is still carried on in very much the same way. In this sheltered Cornish estuary are all the conditions the oyster loves. And the oysterman, handing on his craft from father to son, knows them all. Salt water freshened by streams, equable, and sheltered by the low wooded hills. And in the river, an abundance of plankton, all the microscopic animal and plant life on which the oyster feeds. The oyster is a creature of simple habits. Its only movement, to open and shut its shell. And that, not very wide. Its only defense, to clamp its shell tight together when danger approaches. For in this strange world, below the surface of the water, the law of tooth and claw prevails as cruelly as in any jungle. Tons of oyster and mussel shell, known as culch, provide a clean, firm bed on which, in July or thereabouts, the newly hatched oyster spawn will settle. Culch is the first essential in oyster cultivation. Only where the culch is laid can the breeder count on a reasonable number of oysters surviving. An oyster can lay as many as two million eggs. But so great are the hazards, strong tides, pests, and other dangers, that no more than five or six may ever reach maturity. Until two summers later, the oysterman watches his beds like a farmer his crops. Then the dredges go down. come the young oysters to be sorted and relayed. If his gamble with nature has come off, the couch will bear a harvest of baby oysters, now grown to just about the size of a hen. The young oyster is split off the couch and relayed in fresh beds to flatten up. Left where they were, the oysters would grow stunted and misshapen. Dart was quite happy, but hardly a commercial proposition. On the oysterage map, the temperature of the beds, where the plankton is most abundant, the age of the oysters in each bed, is all carefully charted. But out on the river, the oysterman himself needs no chance. He knows the conditions under his keel. The river has its periods of activity and its times of quiet. But one thing, though, still goes on ceaselessly, protection of the brood. For the oyster, if it survives the hazards of the spawning stage, is the helpless victim of a whole host of predators. First, the starfish which would soon smother the beds if it were not kept in check. Using his sucker rays like the tentacles of an octopus, he forces the oyster open, and clutching it to his stomach, his strong digestive juices do the rest. Then the crab has greater menace as the starfish, crushing the young oyster with powerful claws to get at the succulent meal within. Life for the oyster is not as quiet and peaceful as it may seem. Until recently, when the oyster breeder pulled up a starfish, he would cut it into pieces and throw it back into the water. Then, a few years ago, it was discovered that every single piece formed a new starfish. 
Any time you see a starfish with one long ray and four short ones, that long ray is the remains of the old starfish from which the other rays have grown. Today, the oyster breeder plays safe. All these are taken ashore and their destruction is certain. Another creature very attached to the oyster is the slipper limpet. The slipper limpet found the oyster's back, gathering great colonies of its family around it and living on the oyster's food. So serious is this menace that the oysterman is paid a bonus for every one he brings ashore. Another pest, and perhaps the worst of all, is the whelk tingle, or oyster drill, a kind of sea snail. Its method is simple but effective. It bores a clean hole into the oyster's shell and then devours the oyster at its leisure. Then, when the tide is low, there is the oyster catcher bird, cracking open his occasional oyster. And, of course, there is that beast of prey against whom there is no protection. Us. As soon as there is an art in the month, the oyster's time has come. In some mysterious way, the oysterman can sense if the oyster is ready. And he can't afford to be wrong, because there's one man you can't fool, and that's the chap who's going to eat him. During the season at Helford, the oysters come ashore at the rate of tens of thousands a day. A good man can grade them at the astonishing rate of about 2,000 an hour, and make no mistakes. Oysters go from Helvert all over the country. Barrels, boxes, cartons of 50, ending up at banquets and balls, picnics, parties and pubs. Graded into five sizes, the oyster waits in seawater pits on the shore, which keep it fresh until almost the moment of dispatch. chosen oyster starts on its last journey to a glass of stout, sterilized seawater, circulating at the rate of 2,000 gallons an hour, filter away any trace of impurities. Of course, the modern appetite is nothing. An ordinary Victorian chop house would have offered roast mutton with oysters, boiled oysters, broiled oysters, oyster pie, and pickled oysters, too. Even a steak and kidney pie wasn't complete without a few oysters. Today there are signs that the oyster, often considered only a rich man's delicacy, may in time regain its old, proud position. Sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty to a handful. Into the barrel the oysters go. No longer does the name of Helford mean the pursuing excise men and the toast drunk in smuggled brandy. Today, Helford means an oyster. And if you like them that way, a sprinkling of cayenne pepper and a squeeze of lemon. And whether you believe in chewing or the quick sliver down the gullet, there are times when even the illicit delights of duty-free brandy cannot compare with an oyster from Frenchman's Creek.